Shall we start, ma'am? Yeah. Please. Okay. A uh, very warm welcome and good evening to everyone. I am Dr. Saranda Shivasava, Assistant Professor, Tele Manas uh, uh, member of PG Education Committee West Zone Branch. I welcome you to Tennessee's Tuesday Teachings Third Series Edition 11. Uh, today we will have a discussion on the topic rehabilitation in psychiatry, and uh, we have amongst us very senior and very renowned uh, experts in the um, field, uh, Dr. Krishna uh, Prasad sir, who, is, who will be the speaker of the session and Dr. Shashwat Shere sir, who will chair the session. Uh, so let us begun, begin. So I'd like to introduce, uh, so before the introduction, I'd like to inform everybody about the flow of the sessions. So firstly, I'll introduce uh, the speaker and uh, uh, the chairperson of the session. After that, uh, um, the, there will be a presentation and after presentation, we'll have a session of questions and answers. Uh, you can also write down your questions in the chat box in between the sessions. I'll ask them to sir. And after, uh, uh, after the question answer session, we'll have a short quiz. So please uh, stay back for the quiz. And I'll also be sharing a feedback form in the chat. So I request everybody to please fill it. It will help us to know what all topics are important for you. It will help us to know how we can improve or what we can work on for the session so that it's uh, put to best use for uh, all of you. So uh, I'll, I'd like to introduce our speaker to, for today, Dr. Krishna Prasad sir, who is a professor of psychiatry and head of uh, psychiatric rehabilitation services at NIMHANS here in Bangalore. Uh, he is affiliated with Department of Psychiatry in uh, He has around 15 research grants under him where he is a, a PI and co-I. Uh, he, his research specialization areas of interest are of course rehabilitation and physical health of people with severe mental illnesses, multimorbidity and homeless people living with mental illness. He has around 90 peer-reviewed journal articles under his name and uh, he has written around 12 chapters in books. Uh, very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Saranjo, and the kind introduction. Oh, thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, I'm looking forward to the session. I'd also like to introduce our chairperson for today, Dr. Shashwat Shere sir, who is currently self-employed since 1995 and uh, 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 he works for Santulan Center for Comprehensive Mental Health Care at Ratnagiri Maharashtra. He's, he did his uh, MD and DPM from Nair Hospital, Mumbai and he has served as a lecturer in psychiatry at uh, Institute of Psychiatry and Human Behavior, Goa. Is worked as a psychiatrist class one and medical superintendent at regional mental hospital Ratnagiri. He was visiting honorary psychiatrist at, uh, at child guidance clinic uh, Ratnagiri and he has all these affiliations under his name. He's worked in, in, for reha in the field of rehabilitation uh, uh, intensively and he also uh, he's the founder secretary of this uh, organization and NGO called Avishkar which uh, which works in the area of mentally for helping mentally disabled people which received a national award in the year 2007 um, and he has many research articles under his name in the field of uh, in the area of rehabilitation in psychiatry so uh, i would like to uh, invite uh, you sir uh, thank you so much for coming it's a big honor for all of us to have you here and uh, Thank you for joining. Looking Thank forward. You. Yes, sir. Shilpa, ma'am, would you like to say something? No, just welcome Dr. Krishna Prasad and Dr. Shashwat Shere for agreeing to join this uh, Tenacious Tuesday teaching series. It is meant for our postgraduates. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they are going to help from the expertise of both of you. So I think over to you, uh, Dr. Shere for starting and uh, then you can uh, have your own comments and then Dr. Krishna Prasad can begin. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I'll... 
uh, thank you first uh, uh, ips west zone for bringing up this important topic for discussion and thank you for giving me the opportunity for uh, chairing this uh, session uh, we are all uh, medical graduates and uh, whenever we think of a disease or illness we think about the etiology diagnosis pathology and treatment but most of the time we are focused only on the biological model of it and uh, it's not the complete treatment you know the treatment of a especially in psychiatry the treatment doesn't end at uh, removing the symptoms from the patient or giving him medications to remove the symptom but it goes beyond that uh, and we need to put that patient back into the society into his family and into his working place as far as possible and if there are any shortcomings how to overcome that is the topic of uh, rehabilitation and uh, i uh, wish that all the medical students uh, postgraduate students uh, remember this that uh, the treatment doesn't end at uh, giving medicines and what is beyond that is the topic of discussion it's very important uh, in the practical uh, situations so i request uh, uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad to begin his uh, lecture. Thank you, sir, uh, for the, um, providing a base to the uh, topic uh, that we are discussing today. Let me just share the screen. I hope the screen is visible. Yes. It is, sir. So, like I think uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Shashwat uh, mentioned, uh, we are quite enamored by the fact that uh, a lot of biological understanding of mental illness and uh, uh, particularly severe mental illness uh, has happened in the last few decades and uh, treatments for uh, the same have advanced. Uh, but uh, I think the general notion is that rehabilitation is perhaps uh, not the job of a uh, uh, psychiatrist, uh, but uh, better left to people uh, working uh, with, say, clinical psychologists or psychiatric social workers or allied professionals who work uh, with us. Uh, but I think uh, experienced uh, colleagues and seniors here uh, might tell you that over a period of time, you understand the limitations that uh, several pharmacological agents that we have uh, and the, the, the non-pharmacological interventions that uh, may help a patient come a long way in the journey of uh, recovery. I think uh, with that background, I would uh, start the topic today. And I think while I was searching for the definition of uh, what is mental health rehabilitation, this uh, definition which was offered by uh, Helen Gillespie, uh, who works in the UK, I felt best described what uh, I have understood as uh, rehabilitation in the last decade or so. So, uh, uh, and I think others may also uh, agree with me that it is a whole systems approach. And when we say a whole systems approach, it means that it is not only talking about health, but several other issues uh, in the circumstance uh, that the person is living uh, and who is affected with mental illness. So it's a whole systems approach to recovery from mental illness that maximizes the individual's quality of life and social inclusion. And the focus is on certain words like autonomy, provision of hope, and also what we call as successful community living or now termed a successful community reintegration and through appropriate support from several uh, people surrounding this person affected with mental illness. Now the nature of service users who seek rehabilitation at uh, NIMHANS primarily are people who are non-responders or who have complex uh, psychosis where uh, it is not simply uh, the illness itself, but several other issues surrounding illness, developmental issues, personality uh, issues, uh, or persisting cognitive symptoms. These are the kind of uh, service users who approach us uh, for taking uh, these services at NIMHANS. And it is often difficult to get any evidence-based guidance, or there may not be any evidence-based guidance uh, in the process uh, of helping these patients. One other uh, important uh, consideration one needs to keep in mind is the fact that now there is a greater understanding that most chronic conditions co-occur. So it is important that we recognize and uh, address issues surrounding multi multimorbidity. And often we have people with severe mental illnesses having physical health conditions, which we usually ignore. 
Now, uh, a term that is used in the context of uh, uh, mental illness and uh, health conditions is the term disability. And we see that uh, recovery from disability is a common experience. All of us have experienced uh, common conditions such as uh, common cold or, or even fever and we recover and we get back to our normal routine. So it's a universal experience. Uh, but with mental illness, particularly uh, where the symptoms may last long and the environmental factors may contribute uh, in many ways, I think uh, there are challenges that people have in terms of experiencing recovery. And also unique to mental illness would be issues surrounding cognition, emotion, and insight. And, and uh, the recognition uh, of the challenges that they face may also be uh, a problem in the course of the recovery. I thought it is important to highlight uh, the, the difference between uh, the disability that happens because of mental illness and disability that uh, happens because of physical illness. Because general notion is disability, and if you encounter people who, uh, who are involved in policy making or the general public, the term disability is generally associated with the physical illness because the, there is a visible disability. Whereas with mental illness, it's usually invisible except in certain pe people with, say, very clear psychosis, florid psychosis, where they are having hallucinatory behavior. Otherwise, uh, it may be very latent and hidden. The other important uh, thing is physical illness related disabilities are generally static, but mental illness related disabilities are usually dynamic. Say, for example, for a person with bipolar disorder uh, may have a very dynamic uh, issues surrounding uh, disability. Now, uh, usually we know that uh, pathology is uh, not objective, objectively quantifiable in the context of mental illness, whereas in physical illness, it's more easily quantifiable. So policymakers also look at uh, quantification is an important uh, uh, measure to, uh, to uh, they, they want measurements. So I, I don't <coughs> think it's easy to do that in, in, the, in the context of mental illness. Uh, one other important factor uh, that uh, affects the policy surrounding uh, rehabilitation in any country is that physical illness and people with physical illness have a stronger uh, voice and uh, they are able to advocate for themselves. Whereas people with severe mental illness particularly have lesser voice and they are unable to, or to a limited extent able to advocate for themselves. So I think all of these are important factors to consider when we look at uh, rehabilitation uh, for people with severe mental illness. So generally, uh, we, we are used to, in our training, to a medical model where we believe that uh, pathology is in the individual and the solutions to the pathology are in the treatment and uh, the focus is on eliminating or curing the uh, symptoms. So we believe that disability is a health issue. A, another perspective to uh, disability is looking at it as a social pathology. Uh, and the probably the solutions are in improving accessibility and improving opportunities for people. Uh, the other extreme belief is that environment is the uh, problem and not necessarily uh, the pathology is the problem. And the focus is not so much on eliminating or curing, but rather on uh, reducing the barriers that the individual uh, affected uh, has. So this previous uh, uh, terminology of impairment, disability, and handicap has been done away with. And now uh, the international classification of functioning focuses on functioning activities and uh, participation. So the international classification of functioning, which uh, is a model functioning disability and health, which is a model which has been provided by the WHO, probably will help us understand this concept of disability a little better, that a health condition does not occur in isolation. Uh, it occurs in the context of environmental factors and a lot of personal factors, individual attributes. All of these define the extent to which the person can function in uh, society. So it is uh, not only about involvement of body functions and structure, but their effect on activity and ultimately participation in uh, society. So just to uh, explain what uh, these terms mean, body functions are basically physiological functions of the body, including psychological functions, whereas body structures are anatomical parts of the body, which in our context most likely would be related to brain. And impairments are basically problems in the body function or structure, such as a significant deviation or loss in either function or structure. Now, when ICF uses the term activity, it is basically talking about the execution of a task or action by an individual. 
and when it is talking about participation it is talking about involvement in a life situation so it uses terms such as uh, activity limitations which basically describes the challenges that an individual face faces in executing activities and it it uses the term participation restriction when an individual faces an experience in uh, a challenge in involvement in life situations so the underlying principles of the international classification of functioning is that it is this the the experience of disability is universal that both physical and mental uh, health conditions should be treated with parity and there is a general kind of both ideological uh, neutrality and also that people can move from different ranges of functioning that is from both positively functioning to negatively functioning or what is termed as disability and lot of environmental factors are involved in determining the disability and individual uh, experiences just to exemplify some things uh, uh, a little more clearly uh, and using analogies that probably are a little more understandable in the context of leprosy for example the impairment would be a loss of sensation in the extremities and the activity limitation would be in terms of difficulty in uh, grasping uh, objects participation restriction would be because of stigma because of uh, leprosy and leading to unemployment in schizophrenia uh, impairment may not be very obvious but psychological functions would be affected activity limitation may be may happen because of negative symptoms and people can be denied employment because of prejudice that people may have about people with mental illness similarly with panic disorder anxiety may be an may be a manifestation um, of impairment not being able to go alone outside the house may be an activity limitation because the person does not go outside does not have social relationships that could be an example of participation restriction now people have also looked at other models of disability where again the factors that come in are both structural factors resources that are available to the individual at uh, at a personal level and at a institutional level and personal factors so all of these could determine disability if you see there is a lot of overlap with what the international classification of functioning uh, disability and health also talks about uh, nowadays there is a talk of uh, human rights model because this somewhere uh, very closely aligns with what contemporary understanding of disability is that everybody has uh, respect or dignity everybody is autonomous uh, everybody should be treated equally and people who have similar problems there should be solidarity so uh, so again this respects the universal part of human diversity and uh, that that across several generations of human rights uh, it recognizes that human rights uh, are are universal and uh, basically applicable to everybody so then how is recovery related to disability it is the approach that we take uh, we can always look at a glass being half full or half empty what is important perhaps is uh, to look and listen for personal assets in our interactions with uh, people and we know uh, and probably experience teaches us that a responsive social environment is a cement that builds uh, strengths and what probably is more important than uh, several of the interventions that we do is the mutually valued human relationship which is the bedrock so uh, this uh, figure actually or this uh, diagram kind of uh, describes the challenges that people uh, with severe mental illness face now we all encounter uh, people who have uh, schizophrenia and negative symptoms we recognize uh, expressed emotions we recognize uh, that uh, people have side effects with medications people make impulsive uh, choices they may have coexisting substance use related disorders poor insight lack of opportunity financial difficulties all of these are uh, very very much visible to us yet we probably address very few of them in the process uh, of helping people with uh, mental illness what was telling is the statement uh, from one of our patients that if life is possible recovery is uh, possible now then what is recovery now from a very clinical perspective for us it may appear that uh, a reduction in the positive psychotic symptoms uh, uh, or a reduction in uh, uh, or an improvement in mood uh, which is sustained which you can variably define up to 2 years or up to a few months whatever you define that is a very objective uh, 
very clinical perspective to recovery. But uh, recovery can mean uh, very personally to people and people may have very unique meanings to what they think uh, recovery means to them. So when we asked a few of our patients, uh, which was uh, basically a uh, part of a thesis uh, uh, which a fellowship student did, uh, we understood that people uh, in our context look at recovery uh, having very different meanings to them. For them, it could mean cure from the symptoms. For some, it meant holding a job. For some, it meant simply being happy. Uh, for some, it meant being active, leading a better lifestyle, being able to communicate uh, or being self-reliant psychologically. So I think it means different things to different people. So it, it is not easy that, that way then to measure. This is a very uh, uh, landmark definition of personal recovery, which was given by William Anthony. And I think uh, it continues to be relevant even now, where he describes uh, recovery as being deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills, and or roles. So it, it is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with limitations caused by illness. So it again, uh, very clearly makes it very diffi difficult for us to actually measure when recovery is defined in such a personal manner. Now, uh, this term recovery and the term rehabilitation and the term disability are uh, used across a set of uh, documents which uh, govern our country both in terms of policy and in terms of legislations. So you will be aware that uh, there are two landmark uh, legislations which have been passed in the country. Uh, in 2017, the Mental Health Care Act also uh, focuses on these terms uh, very explicitly. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the legislation that was passed before the Mental Health Care Act, the Rights of Persons with Disability Act in 2016, also emphasizes on uh, these terms. And you must be aware that there is a national mental health policy in 2014, and in its vision and uh, uh, the principles, it emphasizes these uh, terms very explicitly. Uh, so for uh, at, at the governmental level also, there is a separate department under the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, which uh, caters to needs of uh, people with disability and makes policies and rules and regulations uh, for them. So it is important to understand that there is a, a framework that is there in, in terms of governance, but uh, there are several challenges in terms of its implementation. Now, uh, one of the uh, facets of uh, rehabilitation is uh, the meeting the basic needs of uh, people who uh, have mental illness. And particularly people with uh, severe mental illness, we know that they face homelessness, they are institutionalized, and some of us who work in psychiatric institutions or so-called mental hospitals will know that we have several patients who stay chronically. And uh, we also see people who are uh, brought to us as unknown because there is no family member and uh, or they don't have a name. And we do see that very often these are people with uh, severe mental illness. And we also notice that people move from move across institutions. Now, there is a lot of pressure on psychiatric institutions to discharge people uh, with uh, severe mental illness from hospitals. But eventually, there is a possibility that they may get institutionalized in another setting or what is termed as trans-institutionalization uh, may happen. Now, this was a survey which was conducted in 2019. Of course, there are several other National Human Rights Commission uh, reports and the National Commission of Women uh, uh, survey which was done in 2016, which precede this. But this is the most recent, which was conducted in 43 psychiatric facilities across 24 states in the country. You will see that uh, more than a third of the patients that were there in these facilities were living there for more than a year and a median of uh, six years they were staying in these uh, psychiatric institutions. And usually it is women who stay uh, in the, uh, have an extended stay or a long stay when compared to men for several reasons. And it is striking to note that nearly uh, 93 or 94% of them never stepped outside the uh, hospital in this long stay. And only 15% of them were engaged in, in acquiring any kind of uh, skill while they were staying in the hospital. So we also looked, uh, uh, there was a Supreme Court uh, uh, stricture which was passed to several states regarding uh, people uh, with mental illness who are 
what was termed as overstaying in mental hospitals. And uh, as an immediate reaction, the Karnataka government asked us to look at homeless people who are staying in facilities uh, which were providing shelter to people. And we were able to enumerate 144 such facilities in uh, Karnataka, which housed uh, 9,366 homeless persons. So there, there may have been many more people who are living on the streets, which uh, we did not enumerate. We only enumerated people who are living in, uh, in facilities. And if you notice again, more than a third of these are people with severe mental illness, which are strikingly visible. And the mean duration of homelessness in uh, all of them was around 5.86 years. But what was heartening was that the district mental health program was able to penetrate and provide treatment in these facilities and 82% of the participants were on some form of psychotropic treatment. Uh, now, the, the, state, the, the situation of women could be far difficult. So in Karnataka, we have eight state homes which basically shelter women who don't have any form of uh, uh, living space for them. So again, you will notice that uh, the mean duration of stay that people have in these uh, uh, settings is up to uh, 10 years. And more than half of them had severe mental illness. And they, um, uh, they also were not able to access several other services that the government uh, was supposed to uh, provide them. Majority of them wanted to go home, uh, but they had no avenues of uh, going home. And uh, nearly a third of them were mothers, so they had no access to uh, children. So we also had people without mental illness that were uh, staying in these uh, facilities. And you will see that uh, access to identity cards, access to uh, Aadhaar card, or access to a bank account was available to a substantial number of people uh, in these uh, facilities. So in the context of this, we, uh, we also looked at seeing whether a government uh, uh, institution can provide uh, what are called as halfway homes for people who are chronically institutionalized. So one of the campuses which, uh, uh, which at Nimhans we have, we transformed it into a halfway home. And currently we are, we are able to provide uh, this facility for 36 patients. You, you may be aware that uh, halfway homes are kind of a step down from chronic institutionalization. And they should lead to a path of community integration back either into the family or some, some form of independent living. So, but there are very few halfway homes that are uh, provided by the government and uh, uh, majority are not affordable that are there in the private sector. So, for example, the one that is there in Bangalore, which is run by the Richmond Fellowship Society and the Medico Pastoral Association, these are affordable probably to the middle class, but such facilities are not available to uh, people who are from the uh, lower socioeconomic strata. At this facility, we were looking at uh, structuring their day, providing some degree of instrumental activities of daily living and some life skills related training. Uh, to an extent supporting them uh, in terms of vocational training and vocational rehabilitation and also family reintegration where it was possible and some group-based activities. Now the other facet in the journey of recovery is uh, the need of working and work is very important for all of us and so, so also for people with severe mental illness uh, for their quality of life. And uh, in uh, many uh, people you will understand that it is central to the paradigm of recovery. So uh, not only from the point of view of uh, uh, professionals, we also ask for biosocial occupational functioning as a part of our follow-up routinely. All of us ask that. And so also I think it is viewed uh, uh, similarly from the perspective of uh, caregivers also. So working perhaps is central to what currently people understand uh, uh, what is recovery. So one of our students again uh, looked at a qualitative uh, study of uh, asking uh, what are the things that matter to people uh, with schizophrenia uh, in terms of quality of life. So a lot of them uh, actually uh, mentioned work and when they mentioned that when you have some job, then you will have some responsibility, you will have some dignity, you also have income. So it was not only about income, but also about self-satisfaction, building self-esteem, uh, aiding in socializing and improving social value and, and uh, standing. So this underscores the fact that as mental health professionals, I think addressing issues surrounding shelter and work are as important as, say, uh, providing uh, pharmacological interventions. Another of our students looked at 
we get a lot of people who have professional degrees, have severe mental illness, but uh, face a lot of challenges in getting back or returning to work or getting a new job. So I think there are several barriers that uh, uh, people with severe mental illness face by, as far as vocational uh, reintegration is concerned, both in terms of symptoms, poor social support, their own uh, academic underachievement because of illness, the, the, uh, the challenges that they have in covering for disjointed work history, because many of them you would have noticed have disjointed work history. And uh, there are a lot of issues uh, in terms of stigma and discrimination that they face. But uh, there are facilitators too. You might have seen that there are people who, in spite of having symptoms, work because they are having personal strengths or they may be having social support either at the workplace or they may be getting adequate family support. So sometimes we also notice that disclosure that people do uh, at workplace can help them. And the people need not uh, disclose everything. They may disclose it strategically to, to a specific person. So there could be facilitators too, which could help people get back to work. And it is important that we identify. Not everybody is able to go back to work. For some, uh, the, the targets may not be uh, getting back to work. For some, it may be uh, something else because uh, they, are, they are not in a position to be ready to uh, work. So you have some facilities called as daycare centers that are there. So in the high income countries, you have two kinds of daycare centers that are offered. That is work oriented daycare centers and some simply to socialize or meeting oriented daycare uh, centers. So the work-oriented ones can provide opportunities for grading uh, occupations. They may, in a, um, uh, to an extent, move people from providing pre-vocational skills to vocational skills and then linearly moving on to a job and promoting empowerment in them. Uh, besides providing these opportunities, I think what also uh, we have understood is that it also provides a kind of social net network to people and they also start having a worker role in the process. So in several uh, settings, you will see that it is staffed not so much by mental health professionals who are available around the clock, but by occupational therapists, by social workers, sometimes simply orderlies or attendants, and people who provide uh, instruction in uh, vocations or craftsmen. So at NIMHANS, we have 11 uh, training sections uh, which are offered in the daycare centers. And at any point, we have nearly 130 day boarders for whom there is a bus facility, which is uh, provided to both uh, drop them in and uh, drop them back. And uh, these are usually people who stay in Bangalore, but such facilities are not available in um, other cities or it may be limitedly available and run by only non-governmental organizations. But what we've understood is that it gives an opportunity to, uh, to structure the day of the people because many a times we see that our uh, people with severe mental illness do not have a structure to the day. They don't have any any uh, means of uh, behavioral activation. So this gives an opportunity for them to have a structure. It also probably gives avenues to social skills training and to a limited extent vocational training, cognitive retraining. And uh, what we may not uh, uh, realize is important uh, source of recreation and leisure also. So some of the things which uh, may also uh, uh, kind of uh, kindle interest in you to uh, look at uh, uh, even starting these services at uh, your place is to uh, is to make you understand that some of these things that we have tried recently, we have had a patient run photocopying shop, we've had a cafe that has been run by uh, the patients and their caregivers and uh, we also have tied up with an NGO to, uh, to make, make organically uh, produced the Diaz and holy, holy powder, color powder. So at the state government level too, you must realize that even the governments have taken it seriously that these may be a source of, there are people who may not be easily employable, but they may require a, a service that caters to structuring their day. So in Karnataka, in 2014, the government of Karnataka involved NGOs and uh, looked at starting daycare services at each of the district uh, headquarters. But uh, it has kind of been a challenge for the government to run uh, both uh, from the, the difficulties have been both in terms of the uh, inadequate and untimely fund release because of bureaucratic challenges and the, the, many of these patients are scattered and there are challenges in transporting them to the uh, centers. But when we actually spoke to them as a part of again a student thesis, 
we found that uh, there were many people who felt that coming to such a daycare center was actually pro providing better symptom control. And there were some financial benefits because they were sharing profits from the sales of the product. So there were some incentives that they were getting and uh, in terms of better employability in the future. So these were some benefits that people felt uh, because of the daycare centers that they were coming. Globally, if you look at, there are two models of uh, vocational uh, rehabilitation for people with severe mental illness. One is the traditional model of training and placing, where you uh, believe that people with mental illness, uh, after their treatment uh, for in acute care is done, they are not capable of working immediately and may require some degree of retraining or training and then placement. So this is generally dominated by concerns about relapse and it is offered in settings such as uh, sheltered workshops. However, increasingly it is realized that uh, people might be ready to go back and then train themselves uh, at their workplace itself. So this is uh, largely again based on contemporary understanding of disability that it is probably social factors that also uh, are more uh, are probably paramount in disability. And the evidence now is stronger for placing people at workplaces and providing training to them. So one of the examples is a supported employment program that is run in several high income countries for people with severe mental illness. So this is, uh, this is uh, belied by the fact that uh, people with SM severe mental illness are capable of competitive uh, employment and they should not be denied competitive employment. So there is no pre-vocational training or protected employment experience that they have provided as would happen with the train and place model. So they get a chance to choose the kind of work that they want to do. They get that and they have to, and they get support to keep it. So the premise is that people can acquire and keep competitive jobs relatively quickly after joining the uh, program. But you will realize that many of these programs that are run in uh, the high income countries are human resource intensive and there are several other human resources for which probably we do not have equivalents in our country, including employment specialists, vocational or placement officers, and job coaches. So one of the specific programs which is run in uh, several countries now is a program called as a individual placement and support. And of the uh, non-pharmacological interventions uh, that is available for schizophrenia probably has the highest evidence in terms of evidence base for uh, uh, outcomes, not only uh, not only employment outcomes, but also for health-related outcomes. Now, the, again, the focus here is on people getting back to employment, which is competitive, that is mainstream employment, and people immediately should be provided a job opportunity, what is called as a rapid job search. And as I mentioned, it involves a lot of professionals, not only mental health professionals, but also vocational uh, professionals. So. This again is human resource uh, intensive. So in the West, the, the people stop getting welfare benefits or social protection once they get back to a job. So what is called as benefits counseling is also a part of individual uh, placement and support. So here uh, the belief is that people with severe mental illness might require time unlimited support. So all these human resources are geared towards providing individualized support to these people. Now, People have looked at uh, adding things to supported employment, say adding cognitive retraining, which is specific to the job related skills that they need, adding social skills training, adding uh, motivational enhancement, or uh, teaching them uh, skills to manage their illness. And augmenting with all of these, they have looked at individually and also sometimes in combination. And they have found that there, in individual studies, at least that there, there may be some additional uh, effects to uh, simply providing individual placement and support. Now, this is a meta-analysis that has looked at the randomized controlled trials for individual placement and support. And what is evident here is that uh, it not only improves vocational outcomes, but also non-vocational outcomes in terms of general mental health, global functioning, and quality of life, though the evidence is only modest or less than modest. Now, in this context, uh, People even in high income countries are now wondering, is it worth the cost, the individual placement and support model, which they have touted as, uh, as, as probably a very uh, evidence-based intervention for people with severe mental illness. Uh, what about the outcome? So people have actually challenged whether there's a need to look at uh, alternatives. Is there a better way forward? 
and whether simply looking at productivity um, and believing that uh, economics is the only uh, logic so i think people have questioned and now does it matter to us in india because we read all, when you look at uh, rehabilitation literature for severe mental illness you will find a lot of literature around individual placement and support so does this really matter to us so because we don't have so many uh, human resources that are there in the west so we looked at uh, developing a vocational potential assessment tool and a counseling module for people with severe mental illness in in nimhans and we looked at seeing whether a modification of the supported employment program could help people with uh, severe mental illness so it uh, started with the uh, initiating a contact with the potential employer assessing the knowledge of the employer and bridging the challenges that uh, the the employer and the client may have in uh, matching individual needs so what we found is that in 2 years uh, of the 63 patients that were enrolled in the uh, in this uh, study uh, only 32 uh, could be employed and uh, we had a very small number of people who were actually sustaining job at the end of 2 years if you look at it the median number of days that people were employed were only 60 days and there were several challenges that people had both because of poor performance or because of interpersonal issues with colleagues or they were taking unplanned extended leaves uh, or with the relapse of uh, due to relapse of symptoms there were several other reasons too uh, for which people could not sustain job so one of the challenges perhaps even with uh, a lot of support is that uh, uh, probably that's not enough it's or we don't really have uh, the skills to provide support to them or maybe uh, this is the best that we can uh, expect in certain situations so we really don't uh, have an answer as to, uh, to what may be a perfect way to support people in terms of employment now you know that uh, the rbwd act was passed in 2016 and it kind of uh, uh, enshrines certain things which uh, are mandatory for people to follow Uh, both in terms of non discrimination in employment but we practically see that uh, discrimination happens and it is very difficult to quantify or uh, uh, complain about it uh, it also provides for reservation and we know that people with the uh, uh, mental illness uh, come somewhere in that 1% that is available for people with intellectual disability other neurodevelopmental disorders multiple disabilities and uh, so it is this 1% that of the 4% that is available for people with disabilities 1% of the 1% a small fraction is available for people with uh, mental illness now it also asks for creation of special employment exchanges i am not sure how many of them are actually functioning there is one which is close to nimhans we do uh, refer our people uh, to this special employment exchange but uh, practically i have not heard of anybody getting a job through this uh, special employment uh, exchange so there are a lot of things that are there in the law but i think there are a lot of challenges as well in terms of its implementation now many a times people with mental illness and one of the reasons for non sustenance at workplace could be that they probably require a degree of reasonable accommodation now this word reasonable accommodation is a kind of a difficult thing to define in the context of uh, mental illness now in the case of uh, say visual impairment or in the case of hearing disability it is making some or in the case of say locomotor disability structural changes or adding uh, technology to overcome the uh, the uh, the challenges in um, uh, performing an activity could uh, provide an easy avenue but in the case of uh, severe mental illness what we found was that people require modifications in work schedule people require modifications in the work environment people may require uh, modifications in the work related app- appraisal they may require an employer policy which allows them to flexibly work uh, both in terms of shift work or take uh, leaves when needed because of uh, mental illness or say for going for a follow up so and it is again human resource in- intensive because there is a requirement of integration of services so this workplace adjustment that is possible and that has to be reasonable also because organizations will only have limited resources and finances with them so it becomes a challenge yet we have had positive experiences of working with non governmental organizations uh, governmental organizations uh, several firms and uh, uh, corporates and uh, starting at home itself that is in the institute itself looking for opportunities where we can convince the administration uh, for people with the uh, severe mental illness to be employed so what i am uh, reiterating is that 
uh, we should also possibly look at these opportunities wherever we are working to engage uh, with the people around us to employ and uh, provide uh, the, the avenues for working for people with mental illness. One other thing uh, which may be uh, specific to a rehabilitation setting is to look at what the social skills challenges people with uh, mental illness can have, particularly people with uh, schizophrenia. So it can be generic skills or very specific skills to a workplace. And uh, most uh, assessments of social skills will look at verbal, non-verbal, uh, assertiveness related, conversation skills, uh, people's ability to express emotions and social skills training uh, generally is provided uh, with a framework of uh, understanding of uh, the concepts related to behavior therapy and it can be provided in individualized and group settings. We we had a group setting related social skills training that we were running but uh, because of challenges in terms of getting homogeneous uh, people setting together and language related challenges we had to filter it down uh, to individualized uh, uh, skills training. Uh, we've also looked at providing computer-based cognitive uh, remediation uh, where this facilitation of uh, cognitive remediation is uh, done by a therapist uh, at Nimans. So we found uh, positive uh, individual experiences. We have not published this anywhere, but you will know that uh, from several high-income countries and uh, even uh, some studies from our country look at uh, uh, them being useful. Uh, but there are challenges of transferring the skills that are uh, that uh, that happen uh, to real world functioning. One other facet which is uh, important is to uh, look at uh, activities of daily living. Often our focus is on several other domains but not so much on activities of daily living. One of the uh, systematic reviews that we undertook, uh, we were able to realize that uh, there are studies which make us believe that uh, there, is a, there is a scope in uh, addressing this important uh, issue of activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living. One other ignored area is, uh, particularly in the context of people with uh, severe mental illness, is the, the fact that uh, they uh, commonly have physical health conditions and our focus is on mental health or mental health related symptoms and kind of this overshadows the physical health issues that they have. So uh, in a three country survey that we were involved in, we realized that uh, a large fraction of people, uh, nearly half of them actually were unaware that they had a physical health uh, condition. So, uh, and of course, there are other issues surrounding dietary issues and physical activity that uh, you may have uh, already understood in the context of uh, the use of antipsychotics and sedentary lifestyle that people with severe mental illness may lead. Another addressable issue in a rehabilitation setting is the often ignored issue surrounding health risk behaviors, particularly ones uh, related to substance use and uh, very specifically uh, tobacco use. And I think it becomes important that uh, we design interventions uh, that uh, kind of provide a behavioral support to people, not just pharmacological, but also behavioral support, which uh, which now there is some evidence from high income countries that uh, it is it is uh, it was earlier believed that people with severe mental illness probably are not capable to be engaged in uh, behavioral support uh, interventions. But uh, there is some evidence, at least from the UK, to state that uh, behavioral uh, intervention with pharmacotherapy is beneficial and uh, can improve outcomes for people uh, with uh, severe mental illness who use tobacco. Uh, other aspects related to lifestyle are also important that should be addressed. It can be addressed in an individual manner. It can be addressed in a group setting where lifestyle interventions are uh, addressed. We, when we looked at a systematic review that we did, we did not find any uh, with the existing literature, no significant changes in uh, weight, um, waist circumference or body mass index. But a study that was subsequently done uh, and led by a nurse, we noticed that uh, there was some difference that uh, uh, lifestyle intervention could provide for people with severe mental illness. Uh, another unexplored area which is now uh, contemporarily used in the context of addiction is looking at what kind of resources do uh, individuals have, uh, the environment has that enables recovery for them in a personal context. So there are tools that uh, addiction related services are measuring, uh, are using to measure uh, recovery capital. So, but we don't have such tools to uh, to look at uh, in people with severe mental illness. So maybe that is something that we need to look at in people with uh, severe mental illness. And probably that can become a routine part of measurement uh, when we help people with mental illness.
uh, one other often ignored area is uh, the role of uh, peers and i think it is uh, relatively unheard unheard of in our uh, setting uh, but uh, there are attempts to look at uh, forming uh, peer support groups or mutual support programs in the high income countries and uh, uh, the, the who's policy document which is likely to come up uh, they are talking a lot about formal peer support where peers are actually staff who are providing uh, services in mental health settings. So I think increasingly it is uh, being uh, realized that uh, peers are in a position because of their lived experience to provide both emotional and uh, instrumental support. Of course, it is uh, it is it is also important that they should be in a position to disclose their lived uh, experience and shared experiences. Uh, in our context, we know that when compared to the West, we have been repeatedly told that uh, uh, family members probably are the reason why. Uh, outcomes are better in our country. So it is important that we engage with uh, family members, uh, both in the context of uh, the clinical care for an individual patient and also to help them uh, become, um, uh, become a source of support for each other. So I think uh, wherever we are working, I think helping them uh, form alliances or uh, groups is important because in the long run, I think it will improve outcomes for people with mental illness. So we have been running Road to Recovery online programs monthly, every last Friday of a month. And uh, if people are interested, you could uh, you could encourage your uh, caregivers who want to uh, attend these programs online. So uh, there is also probably a need to look at daycare centers for certain uh, conditions which may be related to severe mental illness like uh, dementia. One other concern which uh, often we hear now uh, because now the families are more nuclear, parents are aging, is what after us. So there is no proper framework uh, that is available for uh, us to answer this question of uh, families and it is very, very context and individual uh, specific. However, I think increasingly we re will realize that over the next few years, uh, aging parents and uh, uh, their questions about what after us will, will be something that we will very often encounter. And many, many a times now we are hearing family groups which are working together uh, that uh, we need access to care at doorsteps. So one of the examples where they did not find an answer, uh, they have pressured the government to start at as assisted uh, home care in the state of government because they were able to build a pressure point uh, in, the, in the state of Karnataka. So they are also, uh, I, I mean, one of the caregiver groups which is working uh, has actually kind of uh, looked at scaling it into um, this entire state and uh, also across the country. So people are also coming up with innovative uh, methods of supporting each other. Uh, for example, one of the trusts in uh, Bangalore, which is a trust of uh, family caregivers, is looking at uh, purchasing land and supporting each other by staying together. So when systems are not available, I think people are also looking at uh, making individual plans as well. So several questions that come to us also in the context of disability are the kind of welfare benefits that the government can provide. Individual states have their own policies for providing disability pension. And uh, though the RPWD Act talks about caregiver allowance and uh, unemployment allowance, these are probably not available in uh, many states and probably a handful of states are providing uh, caregiver allowance uh, and unemployment allowance. Uh, now, a large fraction of the people who live in the community don't have access to care. So we need to create community-based rehabilitation programs for people who are living in the rural areas of the country. And uh, there are no um, clear models that are available to us. Some of my colleagues have done uh, tremendous work in individual, uh, uh, individual rural areas. For example, a few taluks in Karnataka, community-based rehabilitation programs have been attempted. But these have been running in the uh, in a project mode and not really in a service mode. And I think when it requires to be scaled up, I think there are several challenges that uh, we will have. So I think I'll finally uh, end by uh, stating that we, as uh, clinicians and as uh, people who are in the course, I think uh, we need to look at mental illness slightly differently, not simply from the biomedical framework. Uh, but shift our focus uh, from clinical recovery to personal recovery. There are several things which may appear trivial to us, including things like identity cards and citizenship rights, like say voting or banking. 
so these are things that we routinely may not focus but i think these are important for uh, for a category of people who come to us and they may be denied access to this and there is a lot of work that needs to be done across sectors so we probably sometimes feel uh, helpless because uh, some things are not under our control but i think broadly if you look at uh, simply not only focusing on pharmacological interventions i think you can provide services that are uh, probably relevant to people with severe mental illness across other domains too which include psychological interventions social interventions economic interventions facilitating some kind of financial assistance for them and addressing physical health issues in them so i think these are important to keep in mind when you are dealing particularly people with severe mental illness so we had uh, three uh, uh, three publications from uh, from our patients and they are interesting and if you wish you may wish to read them uh, one of them um, talks about one of one of the patients talks about what she thinks is a recommendation for a truly inclusive society that she published in a journal that uh, uh, we published from the rehab services at nimhans dr chaturvedi and dr sharma are the editors of this journal so if you have uh, opportunities to encourage people to write caregiver perspectives or user perspectives you may wish to publish in several uh, journals so it is a fulfilling experience uh, both for the clinician uh, taking care of them and also uh, for uh, people because then they are in a position to broadcast and voice uh, their concerns publicly as well it takes a lot of courage for people to disclose so uh, i think another interesting article which was published by another of our patients who is now actively working in a uh, peer support and caregiver forum Uh, is about his experience of cognitive impairment and if you read it it will uh, kind of uh, give you a, a lesson in terms of how we perceive cognitive impairment and how uh, people who actually experience it perceive so i think i'll end with this uh, and i'll uh, request uh, dr shashwat to take over thank you dr krishna prasad it was a very wonderful and very comprehensive uh, view of uh, the area of uh, rehabilitation uh, uh, you have covered very well uh, about the issue of uh, recovery uh, because the personal recovery and clinical recovery are two different things and we should aim at personal recovery uh, i can share with you uh, um, a case which i treated and uh, uh, which comes to my mind just to give you an example uh, one of my patient of a chronic schizophrenia who was uh suffering from auditory hallucinations and active symptoms and uh, he was uh, taking treatment from another psychiatrist who was treating him and raising the antipsychotics to the extent that he would uh, be numb and you know uh, almost sleeping throughout the day and when he came to me and afterwards i uh, gave him insight into his illness and then uh, reduced the drugs he would be he he could uh, work as a salesman he, he used to go to the railway station and sell tea at the early morning and uh, though he had hallucinations he could stay with that and still work and i think that is what we call as recovery rather than just getting rid of his hallucinations with the medicine so just uh, this is the outlook which we should have i work in a rural uh, area and uh, we had uh, a daycare center kind of a thing for working with the intellectually disabled people and uh, during the uh, corona and the uh, lockdown period we had different kind of experience which i would like to share is that uh, we used to uh, train some people with uh, uh, disabled people having some artistic skills so we could uh, produce some uh, artistic uh, things which uh, we could sell and get them some income and when the lockdown came the peop uh, the our clients could not travel to our center so what we did was that we prepared a uh, kits where we could include the raw material we would instruct them uh, at least uh, once on the video and they could practice it and make things at home uh, with their caregivers their parents or uh, help and this worked out very well and the parents also got involved more in their uh, work of rehabilitation and it was a very enriching experience and so the travel and uh, you know the hassles of travel uh, was eliminated and people started working at their home and we what we did was that we focused on uh, production of things which worked around their abilities uh, 
individualized kind of a thing rather than putting or you know fitting trying to fit them into a particular uh, employment or a particular production uh, we develop products according to whatever skills they have so this was a kind of a unique experience which i would like to share so uh, many times uh, as you have mentioned that uh, it is very difficult to place them in a uh, employment and uh, let them uh, maintain that employment it becomes very difficult so uh, we should uh, make it more individualized program and that could help uh, anyway uh, let us uh, put the topic for discussion and more question and answers will come from the students uh, but it was a very wonderful experience of uh, having the review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you both, sir. Uh, uh, I have uh, one question. Dr. Sri Lakshmi, ma'am, asked um, on behalf of all the residents. So, ma'am asked, in your, it is addressed to uh, Dr. Krishna, sir, in your area of work, or Shashar, sir, also, whoever wants to answer. In your area of work, you must frequently have to deal with caregiver expectations and expressed emotions. Any tips to residents on how to deal with the same? I think uh, I'll, I'll uh, check with Dr. Shashar if I can respond or if you would wish to respond. No, you can say whatever you uh, you wish to respond. Yeah, I think uh, we all realize the role that uh, expressed emotions uh, play in terms of uh, uh, the outcome for people with uh, severe uh, mental illness. And we understand that uh, there are uh, positive expressed emotions and uh, negative uh, expressed emotions. And it's in the context of the negative expressed emotions that uh, we face uh, most of uh, the challenges. So uh, I think one of the uh, strategies that at least in rehabilitation settings uh, uh, that can be used to reduce uh, um, expressed emotions, of course, a lot of family related understanding of dynamics, all of that can take place. But one simple strategy, which perhaps uh, can be helpful, uh, would be to say when people uh, uh, come to a daycare center, there is uh, less face time or the, uh, the, the time spent with the, the family member who is critical or who is hostile is uh, very little face to face. So I think uh, looking at reducing face time with the uh, with the family member with whom the person has challenges, I think uh, that perhaps would be a simple thing uh, for people to do. Of course, other strategies like uh, addressing the, uh, the 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 doubts and uh, myths that people may have about mental illness, the doubts that they may have about negative symptoms, the doubt that they may have about uh, the manifestation of the illness itself and psychoeducation related to that uh, may play a role and addressing family dynamics and conflicts may have a role. But I think one simple strategy would be to reduce face time at home in whatever way that you can do. Coming to a daycare is one way, a respite uh, admission is another way. So there could be simple strategies such as these which uh, you could use. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sherry, sir, would you like to say something? Uh, more? Uh, what in our experience, what we have found is that having a group session with caregivers uh, is many times helpful because uh, then they share their individual experiences and express their hostile emotions. And then we can come to uh, some good conclusions that how to handle difficult situations at home with the patient. And uh, that helps and it saves time also. So the group sessions with caregivers is a very uh, good thing to have. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Any more questions from the residents? Yes, Zena, uh, please go ahead. Okay, so I have a question anybody can answer. Um, with regards to cognitive retraining, is there some structured protocol that has shown the most uh, results or the best results or is uh, the most viable option to perform? And after which, which cognitive retraining structured protocol you all found helpful? I'd also like to know what are some of the obstacles that we should watch out for in that process or what is something we might need to take care of? I think some of the things that uh, we should routinely do is to uh, uh, assess uh, uh, cognition. We should also look for uh, reversible uh, causes that uh, may affect uh, uh, cognition. 
so very often uh, it could be thyroid related issues or uh, say vitamin b12 related issues that might uh, require to be um, corrected uh, one of the challenges with the engagement of people uh, uh, in any kind of a cognitive re remediation program is a challenge with motivation uh, itself and uh, the fact that uh, how much is it relevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, real life so i think if you even if you look at literature you will find that uh, there is some degree of change that happens in the parameters that you measure uh, cognitive parameters that you measure uh, but uh, its translation in terms of uh, real life uh, has been uh, limited the, one of the factors is that motivation and its relevance in the specific area where it has to be used uh, but anecdotally we have found that uh, there is a certain category of people who are motivated and willing to work for them it definitely does help but then what about people who don't have the motivation so that is one challenge uh, now there are no standard protocols that uh, that are available uh, at least in our setting for people to use there are several computer based uh, uh, entities that uh, provide these kind of services paid and unpaid uh, but uh, and i mean that is with subscription and uh, free so uh, but uh, really, I think uh, there are challenges in terms of translation. Home-based also protocols have been prepared, but uh, again, who monitors it? How does one uh, follow up on it? Uh, whether the homework assignments that are given and if the family is involved as a co-therapist, there are several challenges uh, that people face. I think uh, there is some evidence uh, a category of people may benefit. Important to look at uh, people in whom there is a reversibility of cognitive uh, deficits. And uh, in some, we have seen that, uh, like this uh, person who has published his experience, that with uh, an anti antipsychotic to which he responded, his cognitive impairment uh, too vanished. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your questions, Anna. I hope uh, you like. Are you satisfied with the? Uh, okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, there are. Uh, so uh, one of the residents asked if we could share the article, sir, with your permission. Uh, yes, please. Okay. 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 I I'll share in the. Tenacious Tuesday teachings group later on. Um, any more questions? Okay. Uh, since there are no more questions, uh, uh, should we move on to the quiz, quiz, ma'am? Yeah. So we have Dr. Bhushan. We have Dr. Bhushan Maitre, who will be the quiz master. Yes, sir. For the day. Saranda is Dr. Krishna Prasad staying, or is he leaving? Because then I would like to. Uh, thank him on behalf of our uh, uh, committee and Dr. Uh, Shashwat yes. Sheri also. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Because it was a very, uh, very uh, concise and very simple uh, approach in uh, this big challenging uh, topic of rehabilitation, which comes in every disorder. Yet, one is not very clear about all the aspects of it. So, I think. Uh, he made it very uh, simple and uh, with evidence, of course, and with their own studies from Nimhans and the work that they have done. So thank you, Dr. Krishna Prasad, for your time and a wonderful presentation. And thank, thank you, Dr. Shere, for sharing, sharing this session and giving your experiences and your inputs as well. So I'm sure uh, we have learned and I'm sure the residents have learned also. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can go ahead with the quiz, Dr. Bush. Yeah, thank you. I remember Dr. Shere for chairing the session because I think at one of the Nair reunion meets, uh, they had displayed the items that they had made at their center. And the clock that I got from there still hangs in my department here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Shere. Okay.
Thank you, sirs. Uh, thank you, Shilpa ma'am. Thank you, Shri Lakshmi ma'am. Uh, so, Dr. Bhushan Maitre will be our quiz master for today. He is associate professor for psychiatry at SKN Medical College, Pune, and also founder director at Healthy Healing Minds uh, Neuropsychiatry Center, Pune. Without further ado, I would like, uh, sir, I would request, sir, to please uh, start the quiz. Yeah, uh, so uh, we will be having 10 uh, questions uh, as we had in previous uh, Tenacious Tuesday teaching sessions. Uh, before beginning, uh, let me announce last uh, uh, result of last quiz, which was held in last month. The, uh, the first is uh, Dr. Vani. She scored 9 out of 10 and... Uh, Second is uh, Dr. Bhagyashree, she scored 8 out of 10. So, congratulations, Dr. Vani and Dr. Bhagyashree. So, Yogendra, can you share the screen so, so that we can begin the quiz? Can I share? Yeah. Yeah, so We are not able to see the responses. Showing zero percent participation. Yeah. I can see the questions and I can see the options and I'm also yeah, uh, marking. Response was zero, I think. Out of 17 participants, we did not receive any response. So any technical difficulty? Yogendra ji, please check. Um, no, madam. Can you see this, uh, please? Quiz. We can see the quiz. We do our host, so we cannot mark, but it is showing 0% participation. I'm trying to mark. I'm on my way. I am okay. reading slowly. Okay, okay. Yogendra, how many responses? Five out of fifteen, sir. Five. Thirty-three percent. Okay. So should we wait? Mm -hmm. 
there are very less participants and mm. most of us are like from the we are two of us are moderators you are there ma'am is there yeah tambura ma'am is there so i don't so we 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 can end the quiz yes sir okay uh thank yeah. you shil hello seven Are we giving the uh, answers to the quiz, Doctor yeah. Bhushan? Yes, yes. So, question number one: Which of the following is the primary goal of psychiatric we rehabilitation? We can't see it. It's not visible. Which is visible? The poll. Sorry. Can I relaunch? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Question number one: Which of the following is the primary goal of psychiatric rehabilitation? The answer is community reintegration. Question number two: The concept of supported employment in psychiatric rehabilitation primarily focuses on offering competitive employment with support. Question number three: In psychiatric rehabilitation, the term social skill training refers to enhancing interpersonal and communication skills question number 4 which of the following is not typically a component of psychiatric rehabilitation answer is ect question number 5 which of the following is component of the chime principle in the concept of recovery in psychiatric rehabilitation answer is hope so chime is uh, acronym for connectedness hope identity meaning and empowerment so hope is the correct answer question number 6 6 in the context of psychiatric disability which of the following best defines disability so disability as we have learned from the session it is limitation in functioning caused by mental illness question number 7 the social model of disability in psychiatry emphasizes the role of societal barriers and attitudes in disabling individuals Question number eight. All of the following are core values of human rights model of disability, except so. Answer is diversity. It should be dignity. So solidarity, equality, autonomy, and dignity. These are the core values. Question number nine. The strength-based approach in psychiatric rehabilitation emphasizes developing treatment plans based on the individual's strengths. Last question. In psychiatric rehabilitation, residential treatment. is most appropriate for those needing a supportive living environment to learn independent living skills so i will share the result and it will be declared in the next session thank you thank you sir thank you uh, and uh, i thank Dr. Shilpa, ma'am. Dr. Sri Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, Ritambra, ma'am is also there. So thank you so much for uh, your presence in the session. You. Were